question you wanted to um, say a word and start the, the seminar? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, it's, it's a truly a pleasure, Mark, to have you with us today. We're very, very proud. I always use you as an example among all my students of the highest ethics of uh, professionals. I work with, I've known you for 30 years and I work with you through the IJPE and you have always shown how high your standards are. So I'm very, very pleased that you are with us today. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for the kind words, Ahmad. I'm not sure I deserve all that, but, but thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our weekly uh, CAT seminar uh, series. Um, a few housekeeping items before uh, we proceed to our introduction of Dr. Snyder. Um, we will have a 40 minute presentation followed by a 20 minute Q&A. Please feel free to raise your hand if you prefer to speak and ask the question yourself or go ahead and type in the question in the chat box and I'd be happy to ask them on your behalf. Um, as I've mentioned, we are very honored to have Dr. Mark Snyder as our um, speaker for today. I believe he is a proud University of Illinois alum, um, where he earned all his three degrees in civil engineering. Currently the president of Pavement Engineering and Research Consultants in Bridgeville, Pennsylvania. Um, and I hope you are excited as me to learn more about today's discussion on modern precast concrete pavement systems that is specially dedicated to Professor Ernie Berenberg. And prior to proceeding, I'd like to invite Professor Reister to share a few words about Dr. Snyder. Thank you, Angeli, and uh, welcome, Mark. It's great for you to speak to the students and all others that are um, with us uh, remotely. Um, it's great knowing Mark for, I don't know how many years we've known each other, but uh, working with him both in professional societies, we've done uh, many conferences together. Uh, we've had our families at the same events. He's visited Chile when I lived there. Uh, we had a conference there and, and did some tourism. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure to have him share his experiences. Uh, particularly, Mark has a great uh, background, unique in the sense that he's, he's been a consultant, he's been a professor, he's been working for contract associations and contractors, so he brings a lot of great um, uh, experience and a viewpoint that's unique, and that's why he's asked to speak all over the world. So, Mark, uh, great to have you back at Illinois. Only wish I could have been there in person, Jeff. Thanks very much for the kind words, though. As, as you as sitting here listening, as you're reading through the, uh, used to be a professor, used to be a consultant, used to do this, used to do that. Can't hold a job, I guess, is what that, that says in the end, right? But I have gotten a lot of good experience along the way, and I've had the, the pleasure of working with a lot of really good people along the way. And I can say, uh, for the benefit of all the students, that I think that we really do have a, uh, a very good group of people in, in concrete pavement engineering in general. Uh, good as, as Imad said, good ethically, good morally, good uh, good friends, good people, good technically sound folks to work with. And it's, it's just been a pleasure for the last 40 some years since I graduated. So I want to talk to you all today about uh, precast concrete pavement systems. And in fact, the first two pictures that you see here were going to be uh, examples of uh, a couple of systems I wanted to talk about, particularly the one on the left is a project I worked on in Hawaii, this is uh, the H1 freeway, the interstate. They call it an interstate in Hawaii. I don't know what other state it connects to, but they call it the interstate highway. It's just west of Honolulu there. And that was a major uh, precast pavement project that was done just about two years ago. On the right is an example of an airfield project. That picture was taken at Dulles International Air, Airfield uh, about two, um, 2002, I think that was taken. Uh, but we'll talk about some other airfield projects as well. Um, outline of the presentation, going to open things up kind of slow here. We're going to, I don't know how much, some of you probably know a fair amount about precast concrete pavements, others maybe less so. So we're going to do a little bit of background work, talk about why we want to have pre-concrete, precast concrete pavements, why we have a need for them. And then we'll go over a brief history of um, their development in the United States. Talk a little bit about the different kinds of precast concrete pavements, what makes them work and, and what their different features are. A little bit on design considerations uh, oriented towards streets and highways, a little bit more on airfield pavements, and then the last uh, few minutes, if we have some time, I'll talk about some recent innovations that you guys might find interesting, because with precast, you have an opportunity to do a lot of things that you probably couldn't do easily with cast in place concrete, and we'll close things out. And as was mentioned, I, I do want to dedicate this presentation to, uh, to Professor Berenberg. Uh, 
who was one of the pioneers really in precast concrete pavement, as you'll see here uh, moving along in this presentation. And he was a, a great friend and mentor to me over the years, not just uh, because he served on my PhD committee there at Illinois, but you know, I, I consulted back and forth with him. And he he's actually the person that got me started in the, the precast concrete area because he was working with the Fort Miller company and then uh, brought me on board to do some of the work that uh, he was no longer interested in doing, I guess. Uh, he was just, you know, time to be done and was willing to move things along. But uh, he, he provided a, a massive amount of guidance over the years and uh, again was a tremendous friend and his uh, loss is deeply felt by, by many of us. All right, so to start out, why do we need precast concrete pavement? Well, we have a problem, right? We have an increasingly old and tired um, infrastructure system, pavement system throughout the country. And we've got photos on the top here. These are all three taken on the same stretch of the uh, 210 freeway in California. Uh, massive amounts of slab cracking, shattered slabs, faulting, settled slabs. But even in our urban areas, we have uh, lower volume roads and arterials that are simply getting old. This one on the left is about a 50 year old pavement. We have rutted asphalt. We have um, utility cuts uh, that destroy the pavements severe rutting and shoving at intersections, as you can see, lots and lots of problems. And we have ways to fix these. I mean, we have entire courses that are developed to how to repair your pavements properly, but a lot of times there's not the time to do them in the short windows we have available. The primary motivation for using precast concrete pavements is the fact that you have limited work windows. And these are three example pavements that you see here. Uh, the Tappan Zee Toll Plaza on the left-hand side, 145,080 T. Uh, Interstate 15 in Ontario, California, 200,000 vehicles per day. Interstate 66 uh, near Fairfax, Virginia. Very, very high volumes of traffic. And we're increasingly a, an impatient society. No one wants to take the time to slow things down and do things right. We have to do it hurried, hurried, hurried. Everyone complains of, about congestion and they're being delayed from their work, user delays and so forth. So we're under the gun. So what we need in these situations is we need to have construction techniques that can be accomplished in very short work windows, you know, eight hours or less many times, thereby causing minimal disruption and yet at the same time are gonna be durable and provide us with a long service life. And precast concrete pavement offers us one alternative for addressing this problem. And I'll tell you, you know, precast pavement, along with rapid set concrete repairs, tend to be much more expensive than conventional pavement repairs. So if you can do it conventionally, you're probably going to do it with conventional materials because it's gonna be more economical to do so. But if you're faced with a very short work window, as short as you know, four or five hours in some cases, you simply cannot demolish and replace and cast new concrete and cure it and get it up to strength and open up to traffic in those situations. Those are the places where precast concrete pavement is going to shine. The advantages, of course, are, are they accrue to both the agencies and to the contractors. For the agencies, you have a pre-engineered system and it's being inspected at the fabrication site in the plant. There's potential for better control of your concrete, for better curing of the concrete. Uh, that reduces your field inspection times and costs. You have the potential for very long service life, 40, 50 years or more. Rapid opening to traffic because the, the pavement slab is already at the required strength before it's installed. So once you get it in place and installed, you can open up to traffic immediately. There is no need to delay for 48 hours or 72 hours for curing. And there's really very little potential for early age construction failure as a result of all that. And if you're on the contractor side, uh, they have fewer risks in the placement, right? There's no need to finish it, no need to cure it, no curing time. You can open up the traffic right away. They have an extended construction season because you can put precast pavement in, in places when you went in places and times and weather conditions that you would not want to do regular paving. You know, you can have snow flurries flying and a little bit of rain coming down and you would not want to be paving conventional pavement in that weather, but you can, if you need to place precast in those conditions. So uh, a number of advantages for contractors as well. Now, precast pavements have been around for a long time. Uh, I've found evidence in the literature going back into the 1930s, even in Russia. The Russians did a lot of work at airfield pavements and so forth, and, and some uh, uh, highway applications as well. The Europeans did some work in the 40s and the 50s, again, primarily at airfields. 
Uh, we really didn't see much in this country until the 1970s when there was some experimental use of precast joint repair panels, just taking out a six or eight foot area around a concrete joint and replacing it with a new uh, slab of concrete that was done in Michigan and Virginia. And then there was a, a number of um, military airfield applications, both demonstrations and trial applications in the 70s and 80s. And you can see the, the states there, New York, California, Florida, and Mississippi. Uh, but it never really took off. Uh, the, pre, the use of precast in the United States never really took off until um, the turn of the century, around 2000, 2001. And it took off in two different directions. And one of the directions was to use precast post-tensioned or pre-stressed concrete pavements. And this was done uh, under the direction and uh, thought processes and, and innovations of Professor Frank McCullough at the University of Texas. And what they did was to do a demonstration project on a frontage road adjacent to Interstate 35 near Georgetown, Texas. And they did about 2,300 centerline feet of pavement in, in two segments on each side of a bridge, uh, eight inches thick. And it was 36 feet wide, so it had two lanes plus shoulders. And the panels uh, in some areas were the full 36 feet wide and about 10 feet long. And you can see those in this picture on the left-hand side. This is a full 36 foot wide piece of concrete here. And it's being positioned here to be placed on this um, bond breaking material. Once that material is in place, and we'll look at some of the details of how this is done, but there, there are pretensioning strands that are inserted through ducts that are cast into those precast panels. The third picture is showing uh, some plastic tubing, a rubber tubing that comes up from uh, holes that go down to the pre-stressing tendon ducts so that you can grout those tendons into place and lock them into place to hold the stress into place. Then the last panel shows a, uh, uh, a photograph of the finished product, as you can see, adjacent to the, the main interstate pavement over here. So it was a demonstration project, project but it was kind of the kickoff of a, a big Federal Highway Administration effort to do more precast concrete pavement technology, specifically using these post-tension systems, because they did demonstrate the advantages of precast in general, as well as some of the specific construction techniques for the post-tensioning process. Uh, the other project that happened at around the same time and was using conventional uh, jointed pavement systems was the Tappan Zee Bridge Toll Plaza, about 25 miles north of downtown New York City. Um, it's a big toll bridge, a very famous bridge, um, essential really for a lot of the commuting traffic in New York. And it was built again around the same time, 2001 to 2002, all done during off-peak hours. Again, you look at this uh, picture here, you had, I think, I believe 15 lanes of, uh, of tollway, of toll booths there. And you can see by the level of traffic, very, very high traffic. The only time the work could be done was off peak, you know, at night, a little bit on weekends. But it was a major reconstruction project. It's not a demonstration project. They put down over a thousand panels, 10 inches thick, you know, 163,000 163, square feet of, of, of pavement installed uh, at about 3,000 square feet per eight hour shift. That's about 16 panels per shift. And then they'd open up the traffic the next morning. So this thing was replaced incrementally over a period of about uh, three, three months of construction or so over that uh, nine month period. Every one of those panels was placed to within plus or minus an eighth of an inch of the desired elevation. So they didn't need to do any grinding. Um, they placed the panels and the traffic would drive on it the next day and they, they got their, their new pavement one panel at a time. And this was developed by Peter Smith at Fort Miller Company, who worked very closely with Professor Berenberg, who served as a consultant to them on the development of the technology that was necessary to accomplish this. And they came up with this bottom slot system. Uh, no one had done bottom slots prior to that time. They came up with grout distribution channels on the bottom of the slabs so that you could inject grout from the surface and uniformly cover the bottom and get uniform support with, with slab support grout. This gasketing system that they had involved there, uh, the whole thing was all developed by, by these two gentlemen here. And uh, again, just a lot of photos of the, the construction process here and the, the finished product. But again, this also demonstrated the, the viability of doing reconstruction under traffic really in high volume urban areas, and also demonstrated the advantages of some of these key uh, features that we talked about on this particular pavement system. That system is really the one that has taken off. I, I would say that probably more than about 
percent or more of the, the precast pavement in the United States and Canada has been built with the jointed system, not with the post-tension system. Uh, this graph on the left shows, uh, this was produced by the Fort Miller Company and showed up till about the year 2013 how things were increasing very, very rapidly. They stopped developing these graphs after that. Uh, but Peter Smith and I did develop a, a manual on precast pavements for the National Precast Concrete Association a couple of years ago, and we updated at least the figures. And as of 2018, 113.5 lane miles had been constructed of jointed precast materials. So, I mean, that's, that's way up off the top of the chart there, right? It has continued to accelerate very rapidly. And you've got a handful of what we'd call high user states. They're high users because they have a lot of congestion. They have a lot of concrete pavements that need to be repaired. California, 52 lane miles. New York, 28. Illinois, particularly the Tollway Authority, 7.4 lane miles. New Jersey, Hawaii, Ontario. So we've got a lot of high user states, but there's really about 30 different states and provinces that have done at least small jobs here and there, less than a lane mile perhaps. So that's the, the, the brief history. Uh, let's get into some of the discussions about the precast systems themselves. Uh, again, we have two different diverging precast pavement systems, the post-tension system and the jointed system. Uh, let's look a little bit at the, the way the precast post-tension system works. And again, you have a prepared base. You're putting down a friction reducing membrane underneath the slab and on top of the prepared base material. And then your panels are placed uh, sequentially on top of that. And your panels often have uh, a, a kind of a tongue and groove system to them. So they have a degree of interlock providing your, your load transfer across these joints. Very often placed uh, full construction width, a couple lanes wide, or as we saw down in the Georgetown project, 36 feet wide, relatively narrow, 10, 11, hardly ever more than 12 feet wide or 12 feet long, I should say, because if you get more than 12 feet long, then you can't transport the panels over the road without getting special permits, right? So you're limited. You have to have one dimension of these panels always needs to be 12 feet or less. And that would include the dimensions of any uh, bars or things that are staking out of them. You can't have you know, more than 12 feet of travel width without having uh, special permits for transport. You see the, uh, the, the longitudinal ducts for the post-tensioning strands and the slots on the surface where you can insert those strands uh, through the, the, uh, the ducts. And uh, you draw the whole thing together uh, you, and you essentially have what is like a, a continuously reinforced pavement. The only joints that you have effectively are the expansion joints, which are maybe 250 to 400 feet apart. Uh, and they're going to be, as you can see here, this really wide one. All the rest of your joints are drawn tight together by the post-tensioning operation. So it essentially behaves kind of like continuously reinforced concrete pavement. You have um, cracks or joints in this case that are every eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet apart, but they are held very, very tightly together. So they do not ever act as working joints or cracks and they don't deteriorate. Uh, the real action takes place at the expansion joints uh, a much greater distance apart. So some photographs, again, these are stockpiled slabs getting ready to be placed. Here's the placement. Uh, again, another shot of the placement on top of the, the, uh, the bond breaking layer there. Here we're feeding the strands into the longitudinal uh, ducts. Here they're applying the hydraulic ram that's going to tension that strand. And then here's the finished product. Advantages, um, well, one of the major advantages that is always championed for the post-tension systems is that it does allow you to increase your structural capacity while holding your, your thickness and your slab geometry constant. So if you've got a place where you can't go any higher, you're going to be uh, matching existing pavement and you don't want to excavate deeper uh, because that takes time. You're in a hurry. You can't excavate deeper and, and, and then reconstruct the base layers and so forth and put in a thicker panel. You want to match what's there for thickness on the existing base but you need additional structural capacity, post-tensioning allows you to do that. Post-tensioning allows you to increase the structural capacity of a thin slab. You can put heavier loads on it. Now your deflections will be higher, but you can carry the load without cracking. Okay, and then the other benefits of course are that it's going to behave kind of like CRCP, the same arguments that you have for CRCP. Fewer functioning joints means lower maintenance and better ride quality in general. Let's talk about the other um, type of precast pavement, the jointed type. 
here we can have pretty much any slab size customized that we want to have. Um, we, we like to use you know very similar panel sizes uh, for production purposes, but you can have different panel sizes, odd shapes, and so forth. Uh, they're typically going to be full lane width, so you know in the U.S. that'd be about 12 feet wide, similar thickness to the adjacent panels, uh, lengths up to 15, 16 feet unless you pre-stress them, in which case you can have larger dimensions, and they're also going to be reinforced, reinforced for transportation and handling. We typically have two tenths to four tenths percent steel in each direction, top and bottom. Okay, in two layers most commonly, and the main purpose of that is for safety in handling. When you've got that slab up in the air over the tops of several people's heads and you're swinging it around off the back of the truck, putting it in position, you don't want to have a catastrophic failure where the thing was vibrated in route in transit, developed a micro crack that nobody saw, and you picked it up and the thing broke down the middle and fell on top of some people's heads. So you have steel there to maintain the integrity of the panels during transport and also safety during placement, but we don't count on that steel in design typically. Okay, and it makes sense really, right? You've got Typically, these are number four bars or number five bars on 12 inches on center. Uh, and if you're going to have two inches of cover above and below the bar to protect it from the environment and so forth, that means that in, a, in an eight or 10 inch slab, those layers of steel are only going to be, you know, four to six inches apart. So you don't get an awful lot of moment resistance from that steel. So we don't count on it, but we know it's there and we know that it does provide some structural benefit and we see some improved performance from that. So we probably ought to have separate performance models for jointed uh, precast pavements. We do have the option of putting in pre-stressing and one of Jeff's favorites I know, structural fiber reinforcing. And we're seeing more of that being used in some cases as well. But the joints themselves are just like cast in place construction joints. They're doweled, they're tied, standard steel load transfer dowel systems. And we can use these, uh, th these are the most universally applied types of pavement because you can have all kinds of panel shapes and uh, you can't have strange panel shapes if you're going to post tension because your your post tensioning stresses get a little bit silly if you uh, have you know strange shapes and you're trying to post tension over a non-rectangular panel here we've got a, uh, some slides of some typical precast uh, pavements again uh, you can see doll bars sticking out of one side slots on the other uh, for the tie bars in this case, but a lot of the panels are produced with dowels out of one end and slots on the other end. As you see here, this is the Tappan Zee Toll Plaza. You're placing your panels in leapfrog fashion. So the slots on the back end of this panel are going on top of the dowels that were protruding from the front end of the previous panel. And you can just keep going one after another like that. And the side slots are taking care of the tie bars here. Most of the modern systems today do include leveling jacks, even if they are being placed on a grade supported system. And we'll talk about grade supported in a minute. But what these leveling slack, what these leveling jacks allow you to do is to really fine tune the elevations of the panels before you put the grout under them to minimize the need for diamond grinding and to minimize roughness and differences in elevation across the joints. So almost all the panels being produced today have leveling jacks. It's a very common thing. Once you have your panels in place, you go down here and you're going to inject grout. You'll have two different kinds of grout. You'll have a very thin bedding grout, which is a, a relatively thin, uh, non-viscous material that will spread out under the entire panel to provide that uniform support and also hardens very rapidly. Then we have a structural grout or a dowel grout, which is a thicker, heavier grout, which is going to go down and encapsulate all the dowel bars and the tie bars that you have to provide that load transfer. Now you can uh, and often will on some high speed systems uh, do diamond grinding to, to, to completely smooth it out and give it a like new pavement uh, ride quality. Uh, and in the end, you have a, a finished pavement system. In this case, I, I, I put an airplane on it. Uh, we wouldn't expect an airplane to be driving down the uh, Tappan Zee Toll Plaza, but just an example of a finished system there. What do we want out of our precast pavements? Well, we want them to emulate cast in place. We want them to be just like a cast in place pavement, except last, last uh, longer perhaps maybe. But a cast in place system we see here on the left, we're paving with concrete. We have uniform support. That concrete is in a uh, plastic state. It conforms completely to the base that it's placed on top of. It completely encapsulates the dowel bars and it has a certain shaped surface geometry. It has a cross slope. It has a, uh, it may have a, a warp to it to accommodate um, 
transitions in and out of super elevation. Uh, they aren't all flat panels, even, even um, in cast in place systems. And it has a surface texture to it for safety, right? We need the same things out of a precast system as well. We need to have load transfer dowels for the um, carrying, sharing the load across the joints. We need uniform slab support. If we don't, the panels will crack. And we need to match the surface geometry of the surrounding slabs. And these ways of approaching those needs are what separate a number of the different competing systems for jointed precast pavements. There's a lot of different methods of achieving support, a lot of different ways to try to level those slabs up. There are different load transfer systems. They may all use doll bars, um, but different ways of, uh, of installing those doll bars and different ways of achieving that surface geometry. We're gonna take a look at these uh, separately. The two primary ways of achieving slab support is by grade support and grout support. And in grade support, we're going to put a lot of effort into finishing the base course that we're going to place that panel on, finishing that to a very high degree of precision within plus or minus an eighth of an inch of where we want it to be such that it conforms perfectly to the bottom of that precast panel. Then when we drop the panel into place, the panel is reasonably fully supported and it's at the proper elevation. And we can actually drive traffic on that panel without putting grout under there for a short duration. So one of the advantages of this approach of grade supported is you can put traffic on for short periods without grouting. And that means it extends your construction window. If you have an eight hour window, you've got almost eight hours then to be installing panels, you know, tearing out the old concrete and putting in the new panels and setting them in place and then opening up the traffic. You don't need to have to cut off two or three hours early and inject your grout and wait for the grout to uh, to set up and give you additional strength. So your production rates can go up. Now the downside is this takes uh, a bit more effort to grade things to that degree of precision. So you've got um, the, yin, the yin and the yang here, if you will. The grout supported systems, uh, the most common way of doing that is with leveling jacks. So you cast your panel uh, a little bit less than the thickness of the surrounding slabs. You drop it down into the hole and then you raise it to the proper elevation using these jacking systems uh, coming in on top of the drill and attaching to the bolt at the top and, and turning those screws to raise the panel to the proper elevation. When it's at the right elevation, then you inject grout down into these uh, ports that go down to the bottom and you fill up the gap underneath completely with grout and you're done. So you don't have to put as much time in up front, but you do have extra cost because that grout tends to be fairly expensive and you can have at least a half an inch probably of half an inch to an inch of uh, grout underneath there. And it's gonna take some time to cure, to gain strength before you can open the traffic. So in this one, you cannot open this to traffic until you have completely installed it, injected the grout and allowed that grout to harden. So there's pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, here's just some pictures showing the grade supported approach to, to show all the work that goes into that. Here's the placement of the bedding material. And they'll use a flowable fill sometimes or a, a fine graded stone sand. They'll place that in. They'll use uh, a shutter screed or a hand operated grader to knock that down to approximately the right elevation. And in order to do that, you'll notice what they've done is they've, they've got these rail systems set up on the side of the repair on both sides. And then they've got a bridge that goes across and the elevation of the, uh, the grading operation is controlled from those rails. But that means someone had to go through and set those rails to the proper elevation. That requires a surveyor and a lot of effort to uh, adjust the elevation screws on that rail system too. So there's a lot of upfront work that goes into doing this. After that first grading pass is done, they'll wet that material down, try to compact it, roll it down a little bit. They'll make a final grading pass again with the same uh, screening system there. And then they'll uh, place their panels on top of that. Now this, this hand operated tool, like I said, that takes a lot of work. We are seeing on larger projects and larger areas, you're not going to do this on individual joint repairs, but on a, a very large project, they're using laser controlled graders. So you've got a 3D model that's been input uh, and you have a com computer control system on top of this grader here, which has uh, got some uh, prisms on top that are sensing the laser and, and making adjustments up and down to the proper elevation of this of this uh, of this screed here. So that helps to improve the, uh, the production rate for that operation. 
Uh, for leveling the panels, um, again, the two most common options I said are the, the grade supported and then the, uh, the, the jacks and injecting the grout underneath. There are two other approaches that are sometimes used, a little less commonly, but they are sometimes used. One is to uh, place stacks of shims at various locations on the grade and the shims have to be surveyed into place. So you get the right size or the right height of a shim stack at each location. Then you place the panel on top of that surveyed shim stack, and then you inject grout underneath that. And then the other approach is simply to uh, drop the panels into the hole and just inject the grout, kind of like slab jacking uh, in, in uh, typical pavement repairs. Inject grout a little bit at a time to raise the panel to the proper elevation. And that takes time and it takes some effort because you can't, for example, if you're a half an inch low, you can't jack one corner up a half an inch and not jack the other corners up at the same time, you'll crack your panel. So you've got to put in a little bit of grout here and then a little bit of grout over here and then a little bit of grout over there and then come back and you keep going around and around raising it a little bit at a time until it all gets to the right elevation. So that is done in some cases. This is a, a photo of the leveling lift, one of the leveling lift systems. This is a proprietary system called the Gracie lift. You can see it installed right here. And you can see this uh, little turquoise colored notch on the top is what you're gonna grab onto it will with, grab onto it with, with the drill and to drive that threaded rod down through to that base plate and lift the entire slab. Again, you have to do this in sequence. You can't lift one corner a half an inch and then go to the next place. You've got to do a little bit here, a little bit the next location, and then keep going around and around, raising it by small increments, less than a quarter of an inch at a time, typically. For joint load transfer systems, we typically are using dowel load transfer systems. Uh, four bars per wheel path is usually enough for highways, usually uniformly distributed along the joints for airfields, typically limiting the relative deflection across the joints to uh, two to three thousandths of an inch. We find relative deflection to be more important, more relevant really than load transfer efficiency, uh, although those requirements are changing. And to put these dowel bars in there means you've got to have some slots of some sort on the top or the bottom or in the middle of the slab even. And here are some of the options. You've already seen the bottom slots over here. Uh, here are some top slot systems. Uh, in this case, they've got a, a very wide and long top slot uh, where they store the full dowel bars. This, this slot is you know, typically 18 to 20 inches deep. And then the other panel has got a receiver slot on it. So when they put the panel in place, someone reaches down with a bar or a hand or something down into this hole and then pushes that dowel bar into position so that it straddles across the joint. Uh, the same thing here. This is a, a different system that does not have a slot all the way to the top. It has what we call a middle slot. It has a, 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 a storage slot on one side and a receiver slot on the other side, only at mid depth of the pavement with a, a slot on top that you can reach down into to insert a rod and push this dowel bar across the joint when the time is right. And you come back in, you fill in with your grout to encapsulate that bar. That's called the Baraglide system. It's also a proprietary system out in California. And there have been a number of precast systems placed with basically dowel bar retrofit. You place the panels in, they have no dowel bars. And after they're in place and they're properly leveled, you come in with ganged saw blades and cut slots in the surface, jackhammer the concrete out, drop dowel bars in, and backfill the slots with a, a, a concrete repair material of some sort. The, uh, the bottom slots have a couple of unique aspects to them. I think I mentioned that they are dovetail shaped. So if, the, uh, if you did have a failure of bond between the backfill grout and the surrounding concrete, it's a wedge shape there so that, that cannot break out. So you still have load transfer even if you lose your bond in this area. That's not true for the top slots. It also leaves with a pretty clean system on top. Uh, you'll have a couple of little holes here on top that are ports you inject grout into one and you can either use the second one as a, uh, a sight glass to see the level of the grout filling up and it also allows the air to escape uh, to confirm that you got good encapsulation of the bar with the grout. Uh, that was a proprietary system also. I think the patent on this either it just came off or it is coming off now. Uh, it's, it's been about 17, 18 years since that was uh, put out there. 
The fourth thing we talked about was matching surface geometry. We said we want to match the geometry of the surrounding pavement surface. We don't have flat pavements out there. You look out there, a lot of things you think are flat slabs are not flat. They have settled over time or they were intentionally um, formed with a, a warped shape to them. You know, we have we have three points determines a plane, right? So in this particular shape, A, A, B, and C determine the plane. And the third corner D is elevated with respect to the other three. That might be in a transition into or out of um, super elevation, or it just could be a settlement that's taken place and you've had some creep in the concrete over time. But if you try to put a, a flat panel back into that area, you're gonna have a problem. Not that it may not be overcome, but you'll have a problem. There are a couple of ways to uh, to create non-planar surfaces. You can put in all flat panels and then grind them to the profile you want. And if you have relatively small amounts of warping to your panels, this is probably a good approach, uh, particularly if you're going to grind anyway. If you've got a quarter inch or, or less of of uh, of, of non-planar condition, then you can grind to that. Now, a problem you're going to have is that presumably the foundation is also non-planar. If you put a flat slab on top of a non-planar foundation, you're not fully supported. And now you lose that ability to open that slab up to traffic um, without risking uh, high stresses and cracking. The other approach is to fabricate your panels to be non-planar. This means a lot of work up front uh, with surveying the existing pavement, taking elevations at the corners of every slab that you want to replace and then fabricating your panels to match exactly those changes in elevation and then using a special uh, form system you can see this this casting bed here is warped the, the back corner here is raised relative to the other three and you need to have special forms to do this uh, again uh, a patented process so you can do it either way there's ways around this let's talk a little bit about design uh, the jointed precast design Basically, it's the same as cast in place jointed concrete pavement. We use the same systems. As I said, we don't typically account for the presence of the steel there, uh, the reinforcing steel in the panels. Um, it's there. We know we get some benefit from it. What may happen in the procedure a lot of times, for example, if you're using pavement ME, instead of limiting your cracking to 10% panel cracking, we'll often see a higher threshold for cracking be implemented, maybe up to 25% because we don't worry about the cracks deteriorating. We can have a crack form in these panels. They're not unreinforced. The reinforcing is of such a high degree, it's you know, half of what you have in CRCP, those cracks aren't gonna deteriorate. Faulting criteria are about the same. We can also maybe get a little bit of relief uh, in that we can account for having uh, somewhat higher flexural stress or compressive stress and take that into account in the design procedure that might shave a half an inch or an inch off your thickness. Uh, because the precast systems uh, often have a higher 28-day uh, strength than what our cast in place might have in the field. Um, our thicknesses, though, tend to be pretty comparable to what we're replacing. Okay, so if you had a 10-inch pavement, you take it out, you're probably going to put in, you know, a nine and a half inch thick pavement just to uh, leave a little room for high foundation materials and, and grout underneath. You'll be pretty similar in thickness. As I mentioned, we can go pre-stressed and we can put in substantially less thickness. So let's talk about how we do that. Uh, thickness design with pre-stressing. This might have been our conventional pavement. The design says you need to have uh, you know three or four inches more. But if we pre-stress it on the same base and same subgrade system, uh, the pre-stressing offsets the tensile stress at the bottom of that slab by compressing the slab. So we can either reduce the thickness of that slab and get the same uh, load carrying capacity or higher load carrying capacity, I should say, or we can use the same thickness as we had before and pre-stress that and get higher structural capacity. And this is usually done with half inch diameter, low relaxation, pre-stressing strands, seven wire strands. And those are typically tensioned to about 31,000 pounds per strand. And after relaxation, uh, the amount of offsetting stress that you get uh, is somewhere between 50 and 300 PSI, depending upon what the thickness of the slab is, how far apart your strands are, et cetera. And you get a lot more information on this if you want. There's a resource here. Uh, you can go to the, the PCI website. They have a lot of information on how to design with these. I'll show you one that I did for a California project just last year. I work with a, a precasting contractor out there, or precasting fabricator, I should say. And this was a, a reconstruction of Route 91 in Anaheim. 
the pavement that they were replacing was 11, they needed to put in 11 and a half foot wide by 15 foot long panels, but they were only, uh, you know, they used tenths of a foot in California instead of inches. They had seven tenths of a foot thick, so 8.4 inches thick. That's a pretty thin pavement. Uh, if you did a, a conventional design for the load, the traffic loads that were expected, you ended up with something like a, an 11, 11 inch thick concrete panel. Um, I did a finite element analysis using Everfee and calculated what the stresses were for various uh, critical load con configurations, tandem loads in the corner, single axles at the edge, and found the stresses were you know, too high, 456 PSI longitudinal stress. Uh, that's going to get you some transverse cracking in, in fairly short order, I would expect. So we decided to use half inch diameter strands on a 12 inch spacing. In that thin of a slab, that gave us a, a reduction of stress of 251 PSI. So we had, instead of 456 PSI, we were down to 205 PSI, which is probably about 30% of your, uh, your flexural strength or less. So no fatigue potential at all. And that was what they went with. So this is an alternative approach to at least the thickness portion of the design. So with all this background, there's a lot of applications for precast concrete pavement systems. Uh, we use them in, co in continuous applications. We use them in uh, joint replacements. Uh, they've been used in a number of bus pads out in California where they need to do a, a very quick overnight replacement because the, the buses on asphalt pavement, they had rutted the asphalt so deeply that they couldn't open the doors of the buses because they would hit the curb on the side. The asphalt had rutted that much. So bus pads, bridge approach panels, uh, very complex intersections like this one that you see in New York City, ramps, uh, off ramps and on ramps, where you've got, again, very complex geometry and, and uh, strange shapes to your panels, airfield pavements and taxiways, uh, industrial driveways, lots and lots and lots of applications. I want to talk a little bit about uh, airfield applications because they have some kind of special considerations. When you look at airfield panels, I mean, how big are those panels? Typically, you're talking as much as 25 feet by 25 feet and thicknesses, you know, 18, 20, 24 inches thick. These are big panels, heavy panels. And those two things, the size and the weight can give you some problems on airfield pavements. As I mentioned earlier, we are limited on what we can put over the road to around 12 feet. So if you've got a precasting facility that's off site, you can't replace a full you know, 20 by 20 panel or a 15 by 20 panel at an airfield. You've got to change your panel sizes. Uh, there are some places where you can ship by water. Uh, that took place at uh, LaGuardia Airport in New York. They made some panels off site and shipped them down the river, down the Hudson River, because the Hudson River is right adjacent to LaGuardia. Um, but more often than not, if you want full size stuff, you've got to do it on the airport, land side fabrication. And then when you do use big panels, you've got lifting limitations. Again, if you look at the weights on these things, uh, 25 by 25 foot panel, 18 inches thick, that might be a typical airfield design, 141,000 pounds. You have to have a very, very large crane sticking up in the air, a very high distance, which is often not desirable to have big, tall things sticking up in the air around airfields, okay? So you've got things you've got to do. You got to either cut the panel sizes down if we want to address the, the weight aspect. And uh, this shows here cutting them in half down to 25 by 12 and a half, keeping the thickness the same, drops it, weight drops by half down to 70,000. We can use quarter size panels, get down to 35,000 pounds. Or we can pre stress, you know, 25 by 25, uh, the full size was 141, but if we pre stress it and get it down to 15 inches thick, we can drop it down to 117. If we could pre stress it enough to get it down to 12 inches, we can cut that weight down to 94,000 pounds. If we do both pre-stressing and small panel sizes, so we can take advantage of the reduced thickness and the reduced size, we can get those panels down to 23,000 pounds or so. So that becomes an option at airfields as well. There have been a few airfield jobs done in the US, only a couple in recent uh, history here. Uh, Dulles Airport in Washington, DC was done with um, a demonstration project on a couple of taxiways. They replaced four 25 by 25 by 14 inch thick panels with precast panels uh, that were 25 by 12 and a half. So they cut them in half and then they were a little bit less thick to uh, allow for the grout underneath. But the demonstration was to show that it could be done. And they did replace these, opened up the traffic in a little over two hours. They did all their sawing the night before. 
but on the replacement night, they pulled the old panels out and put the new panels in and opened up the traffic in just over two hours. Same thing on a, a different uh, taxiway. They replaced again with half size panels. LaGuardia Airport in New York did some work at around the same time, did uh, some work with conventionally reinforced and with pretensioned panels. And as I mentioned, they brought those panels in by barge. But again, it was a very successful project. And not much else has been done in North America until uh, just a couple of years ago here. And up at Vancouver International Airport, uh, they did a pilot project to replace 12 panels on one of their taxi lanes. And the thought was they wanted to see whether or not they could use this for future repair projects on the runway. Okay, and there haven't really been many runway projects done in North America. But these are big panels again, six meters by seven and a half meters. So you can do the math, you're roughly 20 feet by 25 feet. Minimum thickness, uh, 350 millimeters. So you're about 14 inches thick. Um, and they were restricted to being 14 inches thick because the surrounding pavement was also 14 inches thick. Now, when you did a new panel design on this, because they've got the Airbus A380s up there and they've got occasionally that, that big Russian Antonov 225, whatever the heck that number is, they have some big aircraft that come through this airport occasionally. And when you did the design, you need to have at least 18 inches of concrete for a traditional concrete pavement, uh, unreinforced. So the purpose of this was to, to show that you could do it. They did landside uh, fabrication. They, they put up some uh, tents to control the environment and put their precasting tables uh, inside those uh, tented areas there. And they had some special considerations. They also wanted to show that you could do this and install runway lighting in these panels. Now runway lighting uh, and, and taxiway lighting is very, very high precision stuff. Uh, all your, your the precision on the alignment and the elevation of those lightings is within like tenths of a degree. So you can't, uh, you have to put in a system that can be adjusted and yet it needs to be embedded in the slab. You can't just float it in there because the traffic going across is just going to simply crush that thing and push it down. So it needs to be reinforced and embedded in the slab. So they came up with an adjustable uh, light can installation here. And then that also meant once that was installed in the panel, they had limited amounts of adjustment. The panel had to be placed very accurately. The panel couldn't be twisted. And the panel had to be at the right elevation. So this is a very, very high precision operation. Seven of the 12 panels were also non-planar. So they had warped slabs. The engineer in this job uh, was a structural engineer and they designed this really using principles of structural slab design for buildings. Uh, for uh, two-way slabs uh, reinforced and, and suspended up in the air, okay, with these kinds of loads on them. So you look at the reinforcing that's present here, very, very heavily reinforced. And that came into the design in this case. You'll also notice, you can see the, uh, the forms for the dowel slots out here. They had uh, kind of a concentration of dowel bars uh, closer together near the corners of the panels, and they were further apart uh, in the midsections of the panel. So a very unusual design. But they did this over three nights. The first night they did their surveys and they, they laid out where they were going to do their saw cuts. They saw cut the boundaries. And then the second night they came in, they started to demolish the old concrete, remove the old concrete, um, repair the base material. And they did a grade supported system because they wanted to be able to open it up to traffic without having to grout it. So they did a grade supported system. So they're using the shutter screed operation here. They installed their dowel bars drilled and anchored their dowel bars and they dropped the panels into place. That was it for the second night. On the third night then, they came back and adjusted the grade. They had slab jacks put in so they could do some minor adjustments if necessary. They put in the grout and then they sawed and sealed the joints and there's your, your finished application there. So I've, I've reached kind of my 40 minutes. I, I do have a number of real quick slides I'd like to just gloss over for you some interesting things that are going on in the world, innovations in precast concrete pavement. Um, there are removable urban pavement systems and these are made possible. They are smaller panels. And the reason for having these in urban areas is that you know how this goes. You build a road in an urban area, what's the first thing that happens? Utilities decide they got to come back in and replace a sewer line or put in a new power line. They cut your brand new pavement all up. But if you've got a pavement that has small panels, they're built and designed to be removable. You can pull that panel out. The utilities can do their dirty work and you can drop the panel back in and use it again and it looks just like new. So this is a, a another, it's a proprietary system developed by Fort Miller called the Super, uh, Super 
super paver, I think they call it. Panels are roughly six feet square, doweled on all four sides, but the dowel is what's unique here. The dowel is a tubular dowel bar. It's a hollow dowel, slightly larger, but it's hollow. It makes it easier to cut. And the ends of the bars have a, a large uh, hex nut welded into the ends. So when your time comes that you need to remove this thing, you saw cut around the boundaries and you remove the panel and the half of the dowel that's embedded in the part that you lifted out, you just completely jackhammer that material out and you recreate your slots again. The parts that are left remaining in the surrounding pavement, you push a threaded rod in there and you put a drill on that and back, you, you put the rod through the nut that's embedded in the end there and you screw that bolt into the nut and the dowel bar backs out. So it extracts the dowel bar. Then you can simply clean out that slot insert a new dowel bar, grout it into place, and drop your new pan drop your old panel, cleaned up panel, back into place again. This has been done uh, in a number of places. They've done it uh, in a large area of New York City in 2015. It was used in a project uh, several, uh, several, several thousand feet long, I believe it was, in Richmond, Indiana, just uh, a year or so ago. So this is being used um, in some locations. Up in Toronto area, they've done some work with inlays of asphalt pavement. They had some very high traffic, 400,000 vehicles per day on Highway 401 near Toronto. Very deep running of the asphalt, heavy trucks, 35,000 trucks per day. They were only getting three to four years in between having to mill and fill the asphalt. That's unacceptable. So what they decided to do is to try to do a concrete inlay. And they used micro milling, precision micro milling of the asphalt pavement and then placed in uh, 12 foot wide, one lane wide, 15 feet long, eight inch thick panels. And they did a little experiment. They did some that were gonna be asphalt supported. So they just milled the asphalt and put the pavement right on top of it. Some that were grade supported where they milled the asphalt and they put a, uh, a, a coarse sand layer there that they could grade more accurately. And then they did the grout supported version where you drop in the panel and you use your jacks to lift it up and then insert grout underneath. Uh, all of these have been doing pretty well. Uh, they instrumented them for soil pressure and they're doing FWD test monitoring. Uh, this is being uh, work that's being monitored, I believe by, uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank on her name now. Jeffrey Maud, help me. What's the professor's name? What is her name? Susan Ty. Susan Tai, thank you very much. Yeah, Susan, Susan uh, Tai uh, at, at the University of um, uh, Water, Water, she's at Waterloo, right? She was yeah. Waterloo, now McCaster. Pardon me? She was McCaster. Oh, okay. But she's got the monitoring contract on this. So she and her students are, are monitoring the work on this. So uh, it's been good and it's been interesting. There's a lot of work done with instrumented panels. If you got precast panels, you can put things in them and uh, that are useful. Okay, earliest work has been simply with axle sensing systems, pretty simple axle sensing systems that were embedded in the concrete, plug and play. You can simply connect the data collection cables to the uh, panels before you install them, drop them into place and uh, use them. This is being done on some of the tollways authorities up in New York. Uh, way in motion works the same way, a lot more instrumentation, a lot more work involved here, but the same sorts of things being done with a lot of heavy instrumentation for uh, weighing vehicles as they pass across the uh, the pavement section. And here's the conduit that makes the connection for all the electrical. Um, we're seeing some work done at Iowa State University on using uh, heated precast slabs. Uh, they've got a couple of different approaches. One that uses uh, elect electrodes and um, uh, resistance heating basically of the, of the concrete. They've got some other ones where they have um, uh, hoses where they're running warm water through them. And again, it's a precast system. You drop it into place, connect your hoses, and you can see typical Iowa winter. This is the, uh, the test panel here. It's free of ice and snow. And the little in infrared photograph here showing the temperature difference between the surrounding areas and the, uh, and the heated areas. So that's an interesting thing. And then, and then electrified roadways. We're, we're seeing a lot of interest in this in this country. Is actually a bit of it has been done in in Europe already. You know, if if you have electrified roadways and you can take advantage of induction to charge the batteries of vehicles as they pass over the top, 
Now you don't need to have such high capacity batteries in your cars. Your cars and your trucks and your buses can be lighter weight. They can be lower initial cost because you don't have as much battery involved there. And, and you don't have a limitation on your driving range. So instead of having a, a battery charge curve that starts at 100% and goes, uh, goes down to zero in a relatively short distance, as you drive over these uh, inductance power transfer areas, you get a little bit of a boost in your charge and it brings you back up and you get this uh, sawtooth pattern here. So that you can go you know, a much greater distance by simply recharging the, the system. Uh, suitable applications, of course, are at intersections where people are stopped, they're sitting anyway. Uh, taxi stands, bus stops, bus terminals, places where the vehicles rest for a while and uh, have a chance to take advantage of the ability to charge them. Uh, this is some work that was being done in Belgium. They're, they're fabricating these um, windings for the inductive loops here. Uh, and they've, this is just the, the segment that gets embedded. And then they've got these uh, polymer FRP rebars sticking out the side. And then they cast that in. Here you see this, this uh, module that's being cast in with concrete now. It's embedding that entire system. Of course, you got to have vehicles that are capable of uh, using these types of things. That's going to be a, another aspect of it. But they do have some. This is in Bruges, Belgium, where they do have these embedded in some of their uh, uh, bus parking areas for uh, precast uh, charging. Someone have a question there? Um, yes, if you don't mind, um, we have four minutes late, and I apologize for um, interrupting your really nice talking. You know, I've enjoyed it this far, sure. but we do have some questions, and I'd like to allocate the last four minutes of our um, seminar to those, if you don't mind. Sure, I apologize for running over here. Had one more slide on solar generated, and then a lot of acknowledgments, so I was almost there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question from Mike Johnson, are transfer joints in the post-tension type dry fit or grouted? If it is dry fit, are they match cast? Uh, part of that broke up for me. Could you please repeat the question? Sure. Are transfers joints in the post-tension type dry fit or grouted? If dry fit, are they match cast? No, a, a lot of times they'll close, they'll, they, they will be uh, grouted in a sense. A lot of times they'll use a, um, uh, they'll have a doweled, they'll have a doweled joint across that and they may drop in a, a drop-in panel in some of those places of a regular conventional precast system that'll be grouted in from the top. So it'd be a, a bottom slot type panel that would be dropped over the top of, of uh, bars that are sticking out of the ends. There, there's a number of approaches, but that's one of the more common ones. That's been done up in, uh, in Chicago on the, the tollway projects, in fact, with some of their uh, CRCP panel repairs up there. Another question from Jordan, are the steel bars epoxy coated? Uh, yes and no, it depends on the place. Um, it, it, it goes both ways. I think most of the jobs I see are epoxy coated, but I've seen some that are not. Depends on where you're putting it in. I mean, we've got people down in the southern part of the United States that don't use epoxy coated doll bars either yet. So, you know. And from Lama, um, regarding, uh, uh, you know, installing the precast panel, why not simply cast them at the same depth of existing concrete panels? Why do we have to do grading bed bedding technique? Um, and or grag, uh, jack and grout uh, technique? There's a couple of reasons. Uh, um, you have to have uniform support underneath the panel there. And the, the more practical reason really is that um, very often we get into places where the pavement is nominally nine inches thick, but there's some variability in the, the thickness of any pavement. If you go out and take cores in a pavement of a nine inch pavement, you'll find areas where it's eight and a half inches thick and you'll find places where it's 10 inches thick. And if you're fabricating a nine inch thick panel, and you have a very short closure window and you take the old panel out and you find out, oh, in this location it was only eight and a half inches thick. And now my panel sticks up a half an inch too high. Now you've got a really long night ahead of you. You've got to either excavate down or you've got to mill off the top surface. You know, so by casting the panels a little bit less than what we believe it should be. And by doing a lot of adequate pre, uh, prefabrication testing, finding out what exactly the pavement thickness really is in each of these areas, you can save those kinds of problems. But that's why it's usually a little thinner. Um, and just uh, briefly, my personal question is, uh, how often are the panels uh, replaced? And are there special considerations during the rehabilitation of uh, precast concrete? We really haven't seen much um, replacement of, of precast pavements when they are replaced uh, because of a, a construction flaw or maybe something got cracked or they had a cracked panel showed up. 
uh, I guess I would say that we haven't seen much in the way of precast panels being replaced because of long-term service problems. If we have a problem, it usually shows up fairly soon after construction, and that becomes a matter of then cutting back. If you've got embedded doll bars and you didn't use the hollow bars, uh, you're going to have to cut back beyond the ends of the existing bars uh, and remove that larger area and put in you know, a larger panel or two smaller panels. It becomes another repair job, just another repair job. Thank you very much. Um, I think for Omar, I uh, encourage uh, uh, him to send the question uh, to Mark. Unfortunately, we are at the time of our seminar. And again, my, I personally really enjoyed the talk. Uh, Professor Akaidi, did you wanna say some words before we end? As, as always, we enjoy uh, Mark uh, talk and I thank you very much on behalf of our students and faculty. Thank you, Mark, for being with us. We're very proud that you are one of our alumni. Thank you very much, Ahmad. I, I very much appreciate the, the remarks. Thank you. I'll be happy to hang online here a little longer if that person wants to ask. I know that the webinar is, seminar is over, but if someone wants to hang around here for a couple minutes, I can stick around. So.